We had had some incidents at the school. And I think that as a leader, you, you toggle between trying to be neutral when you're hearing information of like, let's hear both sides, let's hear what happened. And I had one of my uh, students call me out and say, you know, Ms. Coburn, I just can't figure you out. Like, I see you, you lead our school, you're a woman of color, but like, what side are you on? This is High Tech High Unboxed. I'm Alec Patton. And this episode comes to you from the 2021 Deeper Learning Conference. We're bringing you an exclusive recording of a Den Talk on the topic of leading school staff and work to address equity and racism. It's hosted by the one and only Ron Berger, so I'm just going to get out of the way and let Ron introduce this episode. I want to welcome everybody. I'm Ron Berger from EL Education. I'm your host. We have two award-winning principals and an award-winning teacher here who are also among the educators I most admire. And they have done, I think, some of the most important work I know in dealing with issues of race in urban education. There's no easy answers here. They're not gonna come with easy answers for us, but I think their real stories of their hard work in their schools are a really great provocation for all of us in the grappling that we're doing on that. The structure will be, I'll be interviewing all three of them after I introduce them. And then we're gonna open it up. So you can be putting questions into the chat throughout this time, because we really hope that there'll be specific strategies and ideas that come up that will be useful to you today. I'm gonna frame today by saying, I'm not going to try to give an argument for why it matters that we deal with issues of race in education. I assume that everyone that's attending understands that really well. And when I'm talking about race in education, I'm saying I understand that students are not gonna succeed in school unless they truly feel they belong. And by belong, I don't just mean allowed to be there. I mean valued and respected, feel like they have agency, feel like their voice is respected and their voice is heard, and they can take a leadership role. So belonging is not just being allowed in the room. Belonging is being valued and respected in the room. And there's many different aspects of students that we need to value. Race is just one of them. Their gender identity is one of them. Their sexual orientation is one of them. Their culture, their language, their body type, all of these things matter. But we're actually separating out race today, not because the intersectionality of all of those things don't matter and aren't always present, but because race is an entirely separate issue in America because we have this crazy culture built on racism where skin color actually matters profoundly in our lives. And so we need to talk about all those issues of belonging and we also separately need to talk about race because it would be easy for race to get lost in other issues. And we, we have to talk about all those issues and we need to directly talk about how racism affects the students that we're dealing with and their identities and their self-image. So that's what today is about. I'm not going to ask any of our speakers to say why that's important. We assume that's important for students to, to feel like they're valued and respected in their building. We're going to talk about how do we help faculty and staff deal with their own identities, their own privilege, their own sense of who they are in ways that they can productively work together to make a culturally responsive culture in their building. The two schools that are being featured today have done that hard work as much as any schools I know, uh, and they are not done with it. They are in the middle of it and it's hard for them all the time. But I have such admiration for them that I, I pleaded with them to come share some of their learning so far. So from Capital City Public Charter School in Washington, DC, we have two award-winning leaders. We have Lena Cox. Lena, can you give a shout to everyone here? Hi, everybody. Lena is uh, the principal of the middle school at a public charter school that serves a thousand students, pre-K through 12. Every graduate of that school has been admitted to college since they had a graduating class. The students are almost all low income, almost all students of color. From Capital City, we also have the first Latinx DC Teacher of the Year, Justin Lopez Cardoz. Justin, can you say hi to everyone? Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. 
Justin was the State Teacher of the Year last year in Washington, D.C. We couldn't be more proud of him. And from Springfield, Massachusetts, we have the award-winning principal of the Springfield Renaissance School, which is a 6 through 12 school, mostly low-income students, mostly students of color, 700 students. That's a district school. It's not a charter from which every single graduate has been admitted to college since the school had a graduating class. And that, I think, Ari has probably 13 graduating classes at this point. I've gone to those graduation ceremonies, most of them, and just been around all the parents crying and cheering. Like, it's a remarkable thing. Aria is the principal of that school and also, uh, like Lena, a mom of kids that are struggling through this pandemic crisis. Aria, can you say hi to everybody here? Hey, everyone. So um, once again, we've got Lena and Justin from Capital City Public Charter School in Washington, D.C. We've got Aria Coburn from Springfield Renaissance School in Springfield, Massachusetts, both fairly large urban schools. What they have had to do is work with their staffs and they have diverse staffs. They don't have staffs that are mostly staffs of color or mostly white. They have diverse staffs with all kinds of backgrounds of people. And they have grappled with how do we have their staffs have conversations about race and about their own identities and about doing work around race with their students. Ari, I'd like to start with you. You have done incredible work by bringing in outside organizations to sort of work with you, right alongside you, to help your staff grapple with their own identities. Some of that's gone easily, some of it's been really hard. Can you talk to us about that process? Absolutely. So we have been um, knee deep in talking about race and equity, I would say for the past eight, nine years. Um, I have been principal for uh, six of those years. Um, and at the start of the jour our journey, um, we partnered with uh, several different um, organizations that we thought would help move us along. Um, and so we did some of the traditional experiences. So for example, we had partners come in and we did the, the crossing the line. You know, we had partners come in and we did infinity groups. Um, and some of those experiences split us further apart. For example, when we had uh, been placed in infinity groups, um, we, we didn't have the bandwidth to continue the work after our partners left, right? And so we had these great professional development experiences um, that, that we weren't able to maintain. We've also had partners come in and give us pools that, that have lived on. So for example, we partnered with um, a professor at Harvard um, and she came in and each of our teachers had to share their story of self. Um, and that was for us the most impactful experience because we have been talking about race, but teachers weren't sharing their own personal journey with it in the sense of how they were entering the conversation. And so for us, that was a lesson that you can't talk about race unless you're really clear about where you're entering and being okay with saying like, I'm not okay with talking about this. And even for me as a leader of color, um, I didn't want to talk about race. And so um, as I shared my story of self, um, I shared, I'm not comfortable talking about this because race is something that I talk about with people that look like me. Um, and so that, that was very impactful. Um, we also had a partner this past year, Khalees Warnham, um, she's out of Brookline, Mass. And she led us through how you mark the moment and you interrupt those ouch moments. Um, and so those experiences have allowed us to deepen uh, our work with the conversations about race and equity, but definitely not easy. And I can tell you that, you know, I'd be lucky to say that half of my staff was like, yes, I'm ready to go. Um, for the most part, um, it, it required a lot of intentional work, um, but we dedicate time to talking about it. And Aria, since I've admired that work, can I ask you one hard follow-up question? Absolutely. When I visited the school, there were certainly teachers, often white teachers, who just said, this is really uncomfortable for me. Like, I, I, this is not, this is just really hard for me. And there were also teachers who said, there were times when I felt like this work made our staff more divided than all on the same team. Can you talk about how you worked through that with people? Like, how did you get beyond that? Um, I think it was first having a retreat with the leaders um, because we had to be really clear that the folks in a leadership role were comfortable talking about race, myself included. 
And so we had partnered with um, different organizations who worked with just the leadership staff. Um, and then uh, we had them work with the entire staff. And I think it was really me naming, this is a goal and this is a priority. It was written into our school improvement plan and it was written into our work plan. And everything that we did, we came back to it. Every professional development race was built in. Um, and so it wasn't something that we did at the beginning of the year to check a box. It was ingrained in all that we did. We shared it with our parents. We shared it with our students. Um, and that was more so me wanting the accountability. So we said to our parents, and we're about 80% students of color, we said, we are going to talk about race. Um, and when we mess up, when your kids come home and say, you know what, Mrs. So-and-so said this, and you know, I'm not comfortable, please call us out on it. And so parents were okay with that. And they absolutely called us. Um, and so teachers knew that um, it was something that we were going to do throughout the year. And when we had professional development, we revisited it. Um, definitely got some pushback. You know, I can remember, you know, getting a call from my union rep um, because a teacher felt that, you know, well, we're talking about race, but I got I to gotta get the students ready for the state assessment. And I said, no, 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 we can't do that. Students need to know that this is important. Forget the state assessment. We are talking about this. Um, and, and I pushed ahead. I also had support from the district. Um, so I know that there's a question in the chat about what's the difference between charter and a district school. Um, a, a district school, we are bound by the rules of Springfield Public Schools. And so I don't have full autonomy um, to do whatever I want. I have to follow what the district says. Um, and so, um, so that's the difference with the district school. It, it's taken a while. And again, even, you know, being in this journey for about nine years, we, we don't have 100% of staff who are eager to go, but they know it's a priority. The students know it's a priority. All of our crew lessons this year, so crew is advisory, all focus on race and equity. You see it everywhere. Um, so. All right. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, Lena and Justin, I'd love to have each of you talk about the fact that at your school, anybody that's that's joining your staff goes through a training around around their sensitivity and understanding of how race is going to affect their work as an educator. It's a part of your entire culture that's built in. Could you talk about how you've come to be that way and what that is like? How do you orient people? How do you get keep keep that alive in your building? So it's central to your whole definition of what a staff member is at your school. So our school is um, 20 years old um, and I started uh, nine years ago. And so there have been a lot of iterations of what our um, training, professional learning, professional development has looked like over the course of the past two decades. Um, but it has always been required and it has always been something that is just, it's an automatic. If you work at Capital City, you are going to do this work. We are going to say the thing and you are going to do this work. Um, we even back it up to the interview. And so, because there's no reason for you to start with us and then discover um, who we are. And so there's a flat out question that is towards the beginning of the interview around you really speaking specifically. And we want to hear examples of work that you do to be an anti-racist um, educator. And your answer to that will depend if we'll determine if we go to the next question or if we jump down three or four questions and end the interview early. We are very serious about who we're bringing into our building and who's going to be standing in front of our students. Um, so that's from the beginning. And then when teachers start and our new teachers go through um, about two weeks of uh, professional development in the summer before the, well, they go through one week and then the rest of the teachers join a week later, there is um, intentional and very direct um, work around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racist um, professional development that happens over the summer. And it is led by Capital City teachers and teacher leaders and staff members. So those staff members are trained in Justin. We'll talk about that because he's a member of that leadership team. Um, but those staff members design the professional development. They implement it. They're the ones who run it during the summer. And then during the school year, it is built in 
to our regular professional development cycle. So we have weekly professional development um, and our equity work is on like a six to seven week cycle that all staff members participate in. Um, the other part of our equity work, along with the larger conversations, we also, like Aria talked about, we do affinity groups. We are a 200 person um, staff, and that is from our, you know, our maintenance staff all the way to our head of school. Everyone has to participate in equity work. If you work outside in operations and you're part of the staff that greet our families at the front door, you have to go through equity training. If you are um, running the school as the school principals and our head of school and our senior leadership team, you have to go through equity training. Everyone is a part of that, um, is a part of that teaching and a part of that learning. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before um, I have Justin talk more about the, the committee and some specifics of the professional development really is just, you know, our, our push has always been beyond that typical question that sometimes comes up in equity work where it's like, you know, name and describe the first time you experienced race. I'm a black woman. I just, I, I experienced it the day I was born. Right. So let's, let's move past that conversation and, and the privilege that there are some people who are adults. And that was the first time that they experienced it. When you are a, a student of color, when you are a teacher of color, we can't afford for everyone else to catch up and decide that now is the time they want to do equity work and they want to understand the experience. That has to be from the jump and that has to be from the core. And so we really push the intention, intentionality um, behind the questions that we're asking and the courageous conversations that we're pushing, that's critical for us because you can't stand in front of our children and not be doing the work for yourself. Following up from Lena's excellent summary of how we um, treat and pursue equity and liberation at our institution, I want to talk a little bit about um, the structure, the professional structure that we use to facilitate equity uh, professional development at our institution. We know that there are several problems existing within the educational landscape. One of them in Washington, DC is that uh, the Latino population is demonstrating the lowest uh, percentage of graduation rate as of last year's graduating class. That's just one of the very many um, problematic statistics that we are seeing in our landscape. And part of that may be because how equity is being treated in a very large landscape is that this type of professional development is viewed as a, well, let's come together to this one workshop where we're invited from different um, LEAs and different schools from around the district. Let's all come together for this one day or two, talk about it, leave, and just hope that we're going to um, strive towards the academic justice of our students. And that is certainly not the case. Equity professional development and personal development is something to not be treated as transient, which is why we are um, instilling an institutional-based equity professional development program for all staff, instructional and operations, through the enactment of what is called our Equity Core Committee. Our Equity Core Committee is composed of three to four members of each campus and organization. We are, as Ron mentioned, in early childhood through um, high school institution, where there are three to four representatives that vary across racial backgrounds and other identity markers to come together and to lead the work that is necessary to develop our staff personally and professionally through the lens of anti-racism, and racial equity. Some of the paths that we take as an equity court committee um, is we focus on three main dimensions of equity. So we see it as um, a path towards sustainability. How are we serving and protecting our staff of color, for example, particularly our black, African-American and Latinx staff to be recruited and to stay um, teaching in our institution? Um, the second avenue is through professional development. What is the most important, relevant professional development given all the roles that we serve at our institution 
that will move the needle and allow our students to to be guided in the direction of academic justice. And then we also focus on policy at Capital City and making sure that the policies, the rules, the regulations, the handbooks um, are being cross-referenced through an anti-racist lens. Once again, we do not just see this professional development and uh, how we do equity at Capital City as a one-time thing. We also don't see it as an extension um, or, or in, a, in a silo, for instance. We don't, even though we do have equity professional development, equity is engraved in everything that we do. Whether we are in team meetings, whether we are um, working as an instructional leadership team, as a senior leadership team, as an operations team, Equity is always the overarching topic and theme with the intentions of ensuring that we are meeting our students and meeting our families where they are given their various racial, ethnic, and other identity marker backgrounds. This is beautiful, guys. I, I couldn't hope for more in the, the clarity and the passion uh, from all of you. I want to push all three of you. Aria, we'll start with you. There's a misperception that because you are admired leaders of color, that this will be easy for you, right? That you have instant credibility, that your students will be able, that you can talk about it easily, that you can lead people to do this easily. And I know that's not true. So I'd like you to, to talk a bit for us about your personal identities, like what's hard for you, your vulnerability in this work. And Aria, to start with you, I know you're an admired black woman who is a great principal. But that doesn't give you instant credibility for your blackness with all of the students in your school. And like your identity is much deeper than being a black woman and that you're leading that work and speaking about your race in front of your in front of the whole student body has not been easy for you. Can you talk about that? Talk about your own process about how to be a, a black leader and make that work. Yeah, so coming in as a new leader um, and I knew that the school was already deep into conversations about race and equity, I hesitated to um, want to talk about race because I didn't want to be a leader coming in and um, as a Black leader saying like, oh, you know, she's coming in as a Black leader. Of course, it's a priority of hers. Um, I also struggled with being comfortable talking about race with my staff. My staff is not very diverse. Um, and so for me to talk about race meant to talk about hurt and pain um, and also to put myself out there for the risk of, you know, someone saying something that I didn't like and then struggling with how do I pull that person in to say that what you said was offensive and you can't say that. And because I was in an emotional place, it wasn't going to sound pretty, right? Because I was, I was in a place of being frustrated with always talking about race, always having, having to carry the weight of it. And so uh, for that first year, I did not talk about it. I I had others lead the work as I figured it out. And actually it was, it was a student who called me out. We had had some incidents at the school. And I think that as a leader, you, you toggle between trying to be neutral when you're hearing information of like, let's hear both sides, let's hear what happened. And I had one of my uh, students call me out and say, you know, Ms. Coburn, I just can't figure you out. Like, I see you, you lead our school, you're a woman of color, but like, what side are you on? Um, and and it, it hurt me to the core because I said, you know, I know that I can't be neutral when it comes to talking about race. Um, and so it was at that moment, um, I actually pulled, um, incident ha happened at our school and I actually pulled the whole grade level together. And I remember saying like, okay, I, I have to break down this barrier of being neutral and I need to speak from my perspective as a black leader. Um, and it was at that moment, I can remember that the students of color came to me and said, finally, finally, Ms. Colburn. So they needed me to be authentic. And that was hard for me. That was hard to share my, my positionality with them. Um, but I know that students needed it. And so, you know, I think the other piece that I deal with is sometimes I feel like my staff others me in the sense of, oh, well, you're so successful as a Black woman. The struggle must not be that real because you're doing good. Um, and every now and then I call it code switching. And I said, you know, similar to what Lena said, at the end of the day, when people look at me, I am a Black woman. I operate as a Black woman. 
Being a leader is secondary for me. When I wake up in the morning, I am black and I am proud and I'm not going to hide that. Because when I am navigating in a system with people who do not look like me, when I walk into a district meeting, the first thing that they see is that's a black principal. And so sometimes it's hard to work with my staff that I feel looks at me. And I don't, I don't know if it's being colorblind, but it's sort of putting me in this box that is the struggle really that hard when you are so successful as, as a black woman? Um, and so I think that that journey um, for me um, has, has been easier over time um, because of just me being comfortable talking about it, me being aware of where I stand um, and me not being sort of neutral when it comes to race because you can't be neutral. You can't. And, and I want to make sure that for my students, they see that I'm, that I'm authentic and that I'm not just having these private conversations in my office with the students of color, but then when I go out in front of everyone, I'm sort of walking this line. Um, and so it was a journey for me um, and I'm, I'm in a good place now um, with talking about race. Uh, we have several student groups at our school um, and, and the focus of those student groups that meet once a week is race and equity and it's led by students and it's work that happens once a week. Aria, thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability and honesty in sharing that. Same question, Lena, to you and Justin, like your own personal identities, how does that play out in your professional work? Yeah, I mean, you know, I have been, and I say it, I, I'm clearly myself, you know, in all spaces, like I am unapologetic about who I am and the pride that I have as a Black woman, the pride that I have um, you know, even just my educational background and the experiences that I've had. And I carry all of that into my school every single day. And so, you know, there's a lot of emotional pain and hurt from um, childhood experiences and attending a private school in Connecticut. So there's just, a, there were a lot of racial issues that I was dealing with there that I carry with me and things that I've had to kind of learn through those experiences. And so one of the biggest things, like in addition to being unapologetic about myself and my own identity and pride, everyone who works with me and knows me also knows I'm unapologetic about that as it pertains to Black and Latinx students and their voice and them being seen and heard. Um, and so there's, I feel like I carry the weight of all of that all of the time, because for me, it's never ever about what I say. It's about how I say it. My tone is always taken into so many different variations. The, the amount of times I have to reread an email before I hit send, the amount of times I have to play out a conversation that I am going to have with someone. Um, you know, sometimes I role play it. Sometimes I'm just playing it out in my head. I'm writing down notes, things that I shouldn't have to do and practice, but I'm a black woman and I'm the school leader. So I always have to think about um, my tone and how it's going to come off. I could say the, you know, one of uh, a white school leader could say the exact same thing that I say, but the way I say it, and because it's coming out of my mouth, as I wear my natural hair and big hoop earrings, it comes off differently. And so I have to constantly check that it's unfair, but it's life. I have to constantly check that. The other thing that, you know, just in full vulnerability and just honesty, you know, imposter syndrome is real and I have it. And so, you know, when you are a, a leader of color, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what background I have and, and what experiences and what degrees hang up in my office and all of that. I I'm constantly um, questioned and, and not just at Capital City, I don't, I don't mean that, I don't necessarily feel that at that in those moments, but I'm questioned, just things that I may say or choices that I may make, um, make me sometimes have more doubt on myself, whereas there are other people that wouldn't think twice about it and they would just do it and it's a part of being a leader, um, but I'm not a leader, I am a black woman leader and there's a difference. And so I have to always think about that with, um, you know, with with things that I'm saying and that I'm doing. 
But in the end, the biggest thing that I remember is I'm that model for my babies. Like those kids are seeing me and I want them, you know, in 20 years to remember their middle school principal and who she was and what she represented and, you know, all of that kind of, all of those types of things. Um, And so I also, like, I wear the weight of wanting to be that person um, for, for my students. So uh, I would like to share a story that I'm actually really nervous uh, to share, but uh, I think that, I hope that uh, it's well received. Um, And I'm calling myself out on my own prejudice and my own potential racism. Um, I feel unapologetic as Lena term, uh, as Lena terms, I feel unapologetic as a Latino. So, and many of the students that I serve and work with are from El Salvador or from Central America, which is where my family is from. So I feel this instant affinity and connection, particularly to my Latinx students who are from Central America. But there has always been one facet of my identity, which has brought about a lot of insecurity, which is my uh, sexual orientation. So I identify as a gay man. And um, I'll speak from the eye when I say that every year when I meet a fresh group of new students, I feel like, well, my identity is now becoming questioned. My students are going to see Um, my mannerisms, or they might see how I interact, uh, or how I use different language and my personality, and they might start feeling, well, is Mr. Lopez Cardozi gay? And this constant and continuous coming out, or this feeling of, what will my students think? What will my families think? What will my Latinx families think in particular? Because when I go back to my own experiences, of coming out to my family, it was not well received at all. And granted, things have gotten much better since I've come out to my family, but I attributed the experiences of coming out to my, uh, the Latinx side of my family um, as a prejudice, unfortunately, for the families and students that I have served. And that happened to me um, in the past. I got married in 2018 and my name changed to Cardozi And, um, you know, a lot of kids are wondering, well, who did you marry? And what was that like? And uh, eventually my students found out that I was gay and that I have a husband. And I'll never forget there was uh, a family that I worked with. We we, We operate in advisories or in crews at Capital City in the middle school. And there was one family that I had and um, the mom reminded me so much of my grandma or my abuela. And my abuela, unfortunately, did not receive my coming out well at all. So I felt myself butching it up, so to speak, deepening my voice, being more calm and poised and less emotional. And when she found out that I was gay and the next student-led conference that we had, she ended up making me rainbow cupcakes. And I, ooh, <laughs> um, it just it really confronted me in that moment that the prejudice can exist. Um, and prejudice is real, even for me as a proud Latino, I can be prejudiced towards my own familia, my own gente. And that's something that I need to change and that I am still working through. Um, and I hope that um, I can continue growing and overcoming um, that barrier that I have experienced in my own personal life. So that way I can be the best educator and the model and mentor that my students deserve. Well, all three of you are modeling courage for us today. Um, I have a lot more questions I would use to draw you out, but I wanna open this up. Is there anyone here with a question that you would like to push? You're a teacher, you're a school leader, you're an organization person who is dealing with this same issue of how do you get your staff to have these hard conversations, these courageous conversations? So I'll I'll, I'll welcome anyone to either put in the chat box or turn on your mic and and you can ask a question of Justin, Lena, Aria, or all of them. So I have a question. So our... um... 
our, our school is, is a prim, primarily a Latino. And so the problem that, I, I guess I shouldn't call it, I should pick a better addiction. The, the situation that I see is that our kids, their um, acceptance of others is very limited because all they know is the Latinos. And so, um, you, you know, you know, my children uh, are bicultural. So I, I have what I, you know, the, 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 the black Mexicans. I have, you know, black and Mexican kids together. So when kids make certain comments, I'll be like, do you know my kids are black? And they're like, you know, because I'll show, I'll have pictures of my children, but my children look like me. But I tell them, but they're black. Their father is black. So they take after their father. And so, you know, but I've, and, and so I've worked in three schools in, uh, in Southern New Mexico and, and now in Texas, and it's the same thing across the board. It is how do we open up their minds? How do we open up the culture? Because we are a almost one race culture, one ethnicity culture. And it's hard for them to have those eyes. And I tell them, the moment you drive eight hours to Dallas, Fort Worth, you're going to see something else. The moment you drive four hours to Albuquerque, New Mexico, you're going to be some, you're going to see something else because the diversity begins to expand. So what, what type of tips do you have for us to be able to work with our schools where the kids need to, we need to open up their eyes to other ethnicities? I mean, one thing I would just say, and and this is just, it's a, a lucky part of who we are because we are a part of EL education. And so our curriculum um, and the expeditions and the texts that we read and all of those types of things um, just naturally lend to interesting conversations and very real conversations um, around current events and around different things going on. Um, so, so much of it, then it doesn't also, it also then doesn't feel separate because it's just a part of the class. It's a part of crew. This is what we're going to talk about today. And like Ari was saying, like in their crews, um, you know, it's all, it, it's about equity. So like, it's like, these are just, this is what we do. Um, so if you, you know, you should definitely look into EL education curriculum, but, and, you know, like thinking about how to pull those conversations to, to be real about those. The other, the other part that I, I find when, um, when we are having um, students disputing and whatever it is, like our restorative circles and um, those types of practices have brought out so much that like teachers are just like, we'll sit back in a restorative circle and the things that come out there. And like, you really want to stand back and just let them have that space because I would much rather them get into it in a restorative circle where we can repair that harm and have those deeper conversations. So the more that you can implement um, restorative practices, not restorative discipline, restorative practices, so that those are just natural things that are happening and allowing that space and exposing students to having those open dialogues with some norms, with a talking stick, with, you know, set criteria. I'm always amazed at the types of conversations that kids have when they're given the space to have it. They're generally not allowed to have those types of conversations, then we expect them to be able to do something when they get in trouble or be able to handle it differently. But we've never taught them how to have those types of arguments or how to have those types of conversations. So implementing restorative practices regularly that are just a part of conversations have been a huge thing, um, a huge thing for us. One thing that I'll add building off of that is marking the moment. So I'll give you an example. Our crew lesson um, has been focused on the incident that happened in, at, in Atlanta. And so um, we, I had a student post something on social media um, and it was a, a black student post something on social media against Asian Americans. And an alumni actually sent me a message on social media to say, Ms. Coburn, have you seen this? I changed my entire schedule, entire schedule, went to every class and said, this is unacceptable. By the end of the day, I want to find out who did it. So it's that tough love. And it's also, again, I'm going to mark the moment. This is on social media. This is about our school. And I ground it back into the mission. These are our goals. And so the student who did it immediately sent me a message in the chat and said like, okay, it was me. 
And we had this conversation and then it gets at what Lena said. Now, how do we repair, right? And so obviously I'm thinking about like, here's what I want to do. But I said, okay, I'm going to give you during lunch, we're going to meet. And by then you need to figure out how you're going to repair this. You have to repair it with your crew, with your class, with the school. I want you to list all of the things that you are going to do. I am then going to follow up tomorrow and make my way into all of the classes so that I can have that conversation so that the kids can know that this wasn't something that was handled private. It is very public. And so I think when you have those situations, you have to make the time for it. We will alter our entire schedule if there's an incident that has happened. We will have a special schedule. We will have a full school assembly if we have to, but we will always mark the moment. And so I saw a question in the chat about how do you start the conversations? To Lena's point, the students lead that. So we have two student groups. We have crew ambassadors, we have a student voice group. And the student voice group, their whole responsibility is looking at policies um, and, and rules in the school. And they have been very, very integral in changing some of the, the policies that we had, even with our Zoom norms. Um, students were saying that they weren't, they weren't culturally inclusive. Um, they wanted teachers to use names every single time. Stop saying, hey guys, hey kiddos, use my name. Um, and I was like, okay. And I gave it to the teachers and we changed it. And so as we're getting ready to reopen, that group has been sharing their voice about what they want to see. And then I respond to it. So I'm not just listening to what they have to say. So like, great, I'm giving it to the leadership team and then they see it implemented. And so students know that they, they are partners with us on the journey. So just a, uh, so a follow-up question to that. So are we talking, in the, and I see someone in, I think Anna put a uh, good question in the, in the chat too. Are we talking at the principal level? Are we talking at the district level? Because, you, you know, how does this work when, when, and I'm not saying that our school doesn't have that support. We do have that support, but where in the hierarchy does this actually begin or how low in the totem pole can you be and still affect change? And Anne uh, Worrell's question, thanks Elizabeth, Anne Worrell's question in particular is, if there's racist structures built in to the systems that you have to deal with, how do you, how do you begin the conversation to confront those? So for example, Arya, you're in a district, there's district policies. Um, those district policies are set primarily by white people in your district. You know, like how do you get the, the policies that are racist how do you get that conversation even happening at that level? Part of the reason why I was asking that question was mostly because, well, I work at a, in a county office of ed. So like we're, we have 42 different school districts. So like it's, it's higher than that even. And when you're trying to dismantle structures in order to design new ones, that means that certain people who currently have the most power are probably going to lose some of their power. Right. And that becomes an issue where you have to do it in a way that people are willing to give up that power so that the people that are no, never at the table where the decisions are being, you know, they're affecting them, they're affecting their own children, the, the table doesn't usually get bigger, right? So like, how do we start having conversations so that, that other people have access to that power and that the people that are giving it up, give it up willingly? Like, how do, how do we have those conversations? So, oh, do you wanna go first? Let me just say this real quick, um, Justin, just because like in talking about it from the, the highest level. So while we are a charter and we don't um, we're different than the district, we're still like we're our own school district, essentially of a thousand students, 200 staff members. Our head of school um, during a retreat this fall, and I was trying to look up the exact name of the thing, um, it's uh, from the Center for Community Organizations uh, by Dismantling Racism Works. Um, it's called White Supremacy Culture and Organizations, and it breaks down all of the different um, aspects of a school culture where, um, I mean, we live in this country that was built on white supremacy. So we know that white supremacy lives within all institutions in this country. And so, and schools were never designed for black and brown children. And so when, when we come to that fact and really look at those breakdowns and you start to break down the aspects of a school culture, our head of school had us look at our discipline policies, our attendance and engagement, had us looking at all of these aspects of um, 
of our school culture and of our school community. And it's essentially a protocol that's taking you through how to dismantle white supremacist, white supremacist policies that exist in your, in your institution. And so I point that out because that is kind of taking it from the, the top down, essentially, and really looking at these policies exist. We know who was, who created them and we know why they were created. So now, now what? How do you dismantle them? What do you do with them? What do you have? What types of conversations do you have to have um, as teachers? What kinds of conversations do we have to have with our families? What are those real conversations and the courageous ones? And then what are the next steps? What are the action items to do with that? And so that that's years of work, but it has to start with actually naming what we know like already exists historically and, and contextually, and then breaking, actually breaking those policies down and being real about what exists in our institutions and not being afraid to, to name that thing and to say it and call it out. That's the only way we're then going to be able to dismantle it. I'll say this as a teacher um, on this call who actually has my principal <laughs> on this call. <laughs> so how would I want to approach Lena in this situation if I am interrogating a policy and I am seeing that there are elements of racism that are embedded in this policy? So proactively, I think it's really important for the relationship between a teacher and an administrator to have a strong degree of trust. But trust is a construct. What are the elements of trust that are needed to have successful communication between a teacher and an administrator before tackling a very sensitive issue that can be intimidating to approach someone in a position of power? So how I view that trust is for an administrator to demonstrate three qualities masterfully. Building credibility, building reliability, so being about it, being about the words that you say, and having an authentic intimacy with your staff. If you have those three characteristics as an administrator, your staff will build that trust that will favor the probability of them approaching you for a sensitive topic. Also, it's important to establish this trust to depress the, um, the self-orientation of a leader, right? So making more selfless moves as a leader to increase that level of trust. So as a proactive measure, building that trust with your staff as a leader will be super important and will open up the avenues to be anti-racist. Being anti-racist is interrogating and confronting those policies or interrogating and confronting the people who are in power who are contributing to elevated prejudice and corrupt power. So opening up that avenue of trust, I would approach Lena because I personally have a strong relationship with her. And there was once a circumstance a couple of years ago where I felt particularly a, a certain type of way about restorative practices running in our school. I thought that we were doing um, a, 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 a good job, but we had the potential to do a better job. So I approached her and asked to facilitate a protocol on our, uh, for our instructional leadership team for all of us as a leadership team to discuss, okay, what is the data saying about our restorative practices? And how are we managing towards desirable outcomes? So the next piece of advice that I have for any educator on here is how I framed it with Lena a few years ago was managing towards those desirable outcomes, putting the perspective on the outcome, putting the perspective on what will lead to sustainable, social, positive change. Um, and since I feel like when we were implementing restorative practices in person, and being mindful of restorative practices virtually, that it improved. Um, and that's because of that, that foundational trust that Lena and I have. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. And let me just push that last to, to Aria. How do you deal with constraints that are vestiges of a, of a white supremacist system that you don't have power over always? 
Yeah, so three years ago, I would have answered this question differently. You know, going to district meetings, certainly um, we uh, at Renaissance do things different being an EL education school. So um, I was always cognizant of what that meant for our school and sort of changing any, any policies. But I think now to Lena's point, when I show up, I am, I'm a black woman. And so regardless of the fact of what the district is saying, if I hear something that doesn't feel like it's going to be in the good service of my black and brown students, not just at my school, but any school in the district, I am going to speak up, I am going to show up and I'm going to disrupt and dismantle anything that I hear. And I think that that's what we have to do when we are pushing this work. Even if you, know, you may say that doesn't apply to my school because we do things different, you can't be at the table in a position uh, to, to disrupt some of that racism and sit there and say, well, that's not my role, that's not my responsibility. So for me, I am okay with being very vocal um, and unapologetic to Lena's point about what needs to happen um, to better advance black and brown students, not just at my school, but, but in all areas um, where I have a seat at the table. Great, we have time just for about one more question. I'm gonna use my, totally selfishly, use my um, power as moderator to throw in a question of my own that's hard for each of you um, for our last comments. Sometimes racism is really overt. Um, and sometimes it's easier to deal with when it's overt. But one of the hardest things to deal with is when you have teachers, and I'm sure all of you have, had this with your colleagues and your staffs who don't seem to truly believe in the capacity of their students. They, they don't actually give their students hard enough work, push their students hard enough, believe in their students enough. Um, because of the, the heritage of racism that they're carrying. How do you deal with that? As a colleague, Justin, as a school leader, Aria and, and Lena. So um, we, we've definitely dealt with that. Uh, we did a book study, um, Zaretta Hammond, um, and then we also looked at deficit thinking. And so it's been something that we've been using, but we pushed the conversation. Um, we, we definitely are a data-driven school um, and we've been trying to create um, narratives for students that are based off of data, but not with the deficit lens. And so EL has definitely provided us a lot of framework of how do you look at the data and not create sort of this like, oh, the kids just can't do it. I mean, look at the achievement gap. Um, and we've been focused really on the opportunity gap to say like, what are the conditions for learning that we need to create here at the school? Let's stop talking about what students can't do. Let's talk about what they can do. And let's talk about what our role is in creating those conditions because we have to look at what our responsibility is and making sure that the students are getting the opportunities that they deserve um, to, to better their learning outcomes. I would um, completely piggyback off of everything Aria said and really thinking about, you know, there's obviously a ton of books to do as book studies and like having these conversations and um, data is critical and looking at, and I was having this conversation in the chat, um, you know, we, we don't just look at test scores and we believe in three dimensions of achievement. So we're looking at mastery of knowledge and skills. We're looking at character. We're looking at high quality work. So it's not just, a standardized test. So we're looking at all of that and really building this full picture of who the student is um, and really trying to coach the teachers and work with the teachers. And what and the next problem would just be fully transparent. If that doesn't work, then you can't teach at my school and I'm going to have to coach you out because my kids cannot be sacrificed. So I'm going to try and help you and I'm going to give you as many resources and I'm going to put supports in place and I'm going to work with you and I'm going to coach because I'm a forever teacher and I'm a forever educator. But there comes a point where if you've made it clear that you can't see that side to my students, then my school is not the place for you. And that actually has to be called out and we cannot continue to have teachers just in our schools, even though when a, te when a teacher shows you who they are, believe them. And so we work with you as long as we can and we do everything possible, but we can't sacrifice our children for that. And so if that doesn't work after we've done all of that, if that unfortunately doesn't work, I will happily help you find another career path because educating is not it. Period. Period. Mic drop. Listen, 
I operate off the motto of if I see it or hear it, I'm going to say something. And I know that that is much more difficult uh, done than said. But I view myself as just as racist, just as problematic of being silent and not speaking up and saying something. Now, some folks, my, my style, I call out. I don't have a problem calling out anyone uh, because this is something that I'm very passionate about. But just because I, you know, I, I might even perceive myself as a little outspoken every now and then, you know, doesn't mean that someone who isn't as passionate or isn't as, doesn't mean that they can formulate a way to engage in a courageous conversation with someone about something that they're seeing. So one of the things that Capital City does in the event is we actually um, share um, a courageous conversation protocol um, in the event that something happens. So um, if a teacher is interacting with another teacher and it's like, oh my goodness, there was some racist notions that were made about our students or deficit base that are, that are linked to race or ethnicity, then there's a protocol that we have developed as an equity core committee for those folks to refer to uh, and to think about it, we have the 24, 48 hour rule, 24 hours. If it's still bothering you, you got to say something, but you have to say something within that 48 hours of the occurrence happening. Right. And then there are steps that can be taken um, that, that we've outlined for our staff. And they're based on um, the courageous conversations and the literature that we uh, leverage during our professional development. Um, but yeah, in a nutshell, how do I deal with it? I confront it and I'm not afraid to because it, it's, it's not time. We don't have time to, you know, to deal with, to deal with racism, not in our school, not with our staff. No, thank you. Well, I've got some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that we're going to have to close. The good news is that Alec Patton has been recording all of this and is going to publish a podcast of this entire session. So if there's someone that you love or care about who's an educator who you think, I wish they had been here to listen to these three brilliant educators open their hearts and souls, they will be able to listen to it by tomorrow because Alec is so organized that he's going to have this thing as a published podcast by tomorrow as part of the Unboxed podcast series. So thank you, Alec. Um, but mostly put some love in the chat for three of the educators I most admire in the world. This was an incredible session. Boy, I could not have asked for more. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming here and sort of opening your hearts to, to listen to this. This is like the most important work for us to be doing. We can't walk away from it. So Lena, Justin, Aria, just deepest thanks to you for your practice and for your openness here today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. That means a lot coming from you. Have a great conference, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi to Kai Unboxed is hosted and produced by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. Huge thanks to this episode's guest host, Ron Berger, and to his guests, Lena Cox, Justin Lopez Cardozi, and Aria Coburn. You can find out more about the Deeper Learning Conference and find links to other great stuff from this year's conference at www.deeper-learning.org. Thanks for listening.